Jonah in the belly of the whale. I heard someone talking about Jonah the other day, maybe it was in a YouTube video, and I realized that it's been a very long time since I engaged with that particular story. It's one of the most famous Bible stories, I suppose, along with the creation story and the flood story. Jonah is one of the names that people will remember from the Bible, even if they've never read the Bible. I assume it's a popular Sunday school story. I, I wouldn't know. I, I never went to Sunday school or taught it when I was working in a parish. But it sounds like the kind of story that would make the list. I haven't looked at any biblical issues lately on this channel and I thought this might be a good one to take up. It also enables me to make an important point about the nature of the Bible and how it's to be interpreted, but I'll get to that later. Oh, for those who haven't tuned into my videos before, I used to be a Christian. I used to be an Anglican priest, in fact. I'm no longer a believer, but I, I still find the Bible interesting. I approach it now, as I did then, with all the tools of historical literary criticism that I can bring to bear. I'm interested in all things philosophical and in the history of ideas, and the Bible is certainly part of that. The story of Jonah's encounter with the city of Nineveh is set in the 8th century BCE, at a time when the Assyrian Empire was in ascendancy and Nineveh was a major city, not an Israelite city, note. But although it's set in the 8th century BCE, the story was probably written around the 5th or 4th century BCE. The theological themes, language and literary style seem more aligned with that period. This is not unanimously accepted, but it seems most likely to me, and it's the most widely held view. So what is this story? Bear with me as I summarise it. I'm, I'm sorry if you're very familiar with it. So God calls his prophet Jonah and commands him to go to Nineveh and preach against its wickedness. Instead of obeying, Jonah flees in the opposite direction. He boards a ship bound for a place called Tarshish, trying to escape God's presence. While Jonah's at sea, God sends a great storm, threatening to sink the ship. The sailors, who are all terrified, pray to their gods, to various gods, and they cast lots to determine who's responsible for the calamity, and the lot falls on Jonah. Jonah admits he's fleeing from God and tells the sailors to throw him into the sea to calm the storm. Reluctantly, they comply, and as soon as Jonah is cast into the sea, the storm subsides. The sailors offer sacrifices to God. This is the bit that you'll probably be most familiar with. God then sends a great fish, often interpreted as a whale. He really just means a, a big sea creature here. He sends this big fish to swallow Jonah, and he remains in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prays a heartfelt prayer of repentance and thanksgiving for God's mercy. He acknowledges God's power and vows to follow his will. And after these three days, the fish vomits Jonah up onto dry land. God then commands Jonah again to go to Nineveh, and this time he obeys. Jonah enters Nineveh and delivers a simple message. Forty days from now, Nineveh will be overthrown. Surprisingly, the people of Nineveh, from the king right down to the commoners, they actually believe Jonah's message and they repent in sackcloth and ashes. Even the animals are covered in sackcloth as a sign of collective repentance. And seeing their genuine repentance, God actually relents and decides to spare the city from destruction. Now Jonah's really pissed off that God showed mercy to Nineveh. He feels that his prophecy of destruction has been discredited and that God's mercy is unfair. Jonah sits outside the city sulking for a while. God then does some stuff with a plant to make the point that Jonah cares about the plant, but not about the people of Nineveh, whereas God cares deeply for the more than 120,000 people in the city, plus the animals. OK, so that's the story in a nutshell. What's its meaning? How would the people who heard this story originally have understood it? Well. I think, first of all, people would have been startled that God would even concern himself at all with the people of Nineveh, who weren't, after all, the chosen people. 
Jonah certainly didn't want to go there. He probably didn't think it was safe and he probably didn't want to mix with these godless people. And then when they actually repent, well, this is surely a message to the people of Israel of the day. Look at these people who don't even know me, with whom I have no covenant, but nevertheless they repent when they hear my word. Why is it then that you repeatedly do not? And Jesus in the Gospels later uses this story to deliver that same message. Even the other people on the ship with Jonah show reverence for the God of the Hebrews. They don't want to anger him. Non-Israelites become models for the people of Israel. And God reveals that he actually cares for these people. This was probably unheard of. These non-Israelites show repentance and God actually cares for them. Pretty radical ideas at the time, I think. Now this story was written most likely after the return of some of the people of Israel from captivity in Babylon, when the people of Israel were wrestling with their place in the world. The Jewish community was grappling with its own identity, wondering about its relationship with foreign nations and, and God's dealings with other peoples. This story challenges the exclusivist attitudes that some Israelites may have held, implying that God actually values repentance and righteousness above ethnicity or nationality. Not a bad message, you might think. Okay, so now that's all well and good, identifying the meaning of the story and its place in the history of Israel and in the evolving landscape of the theology of the Jewish people. But there's another question that I want to finish on. The people who first heard this story, would they think that this was an historical tale? Would they have thought that these events actually took place? I would say almost certainly no. They would have recognized this as a didactic tale, a teaching story, much like the book of Job, I think. And that also isn't understood as history. The story of Jonah was a morality tale, like a fable. The people who first heard it wouldn't have thought that Jonah was actually swallowed by a big fish, nor even that a prophet was actually sent to the city of Nineveh. There are elements in the story that they would have been familiar with. They would have recognised the exaggerations, such as the big fish, the description of Nineveh as being three days across. They would have recognised the use of satire and irony and, and so on. They would have known that this was a story created to make an important theological point rather than an historical account. Just as surely as we know that the Marvel film Thor Ragnarok is not an historical account or a documentary on Norse mythology. After some time passed, as this book became incorporated into what was becoming the Bible, people may have begun to believe that this story was a literal account. Because it tells the story of a prophet, the book came to be included among the Minor Prophets, one of the twelve Minor Prophets, even though its literary style is quite different from the other prophetic writings. It's clearly a story about a prophet rather than a record of the prophet's words. Despite this, though, we can be reasonably confident that the author did not intend this story to be taken literally, and its first readers or hearers would have realised that. I think most Christians who read this story today will also recognise this. They'll realise that it's a, a kind of morality tale, a didactic story, or a fable if you like, rather than an historical account. There dwell among us, though, chiefly of course among fundamentalist evangelical Christians, those who will insist that this story is meant to be taken literally that it reports events that actually occurred. Just a very quick Google search reveals these people. Pastor Chuck Swindoll on his fancy looking site, Insight for Living, in the opening line of his discussion of Jonah writes, the book of Jonah, written primarily in the third person, does not explicitly name the prophet as the author of his own account, but we have no reason to doubt either the inspiration or the historical veracity of the book. On a site with the rather pretentious domain name Christianity.com, I could find no about page anywhere on this website to say who actually ran this site. 
But there we find a story entitled, Why is the story and meaning of Jonah and the whale often mistaken? And we read, When atheists want to make their point against Christianity, they often look to Jonah. They say that a fish could not swallow a man or spit him out. Christians reply, Christians note, Christians reply that the fish was probably a whale and that a whale is easily large enough to swallow a man. She then goes on to explain in more detail how this may have happened. On a site called the Gospel Coalition, incidentally I'll leave links to these particular sites in the articles I'm referring to down below in the description. So this site, the Gospel Coalition, we read there, If you accept the existence of God and the resurrection of Christ, far greater miracle, then there is nothing particularly difficult about reading Jonah literally. Certainly many people today believe all miracles are impossible, but that scepticism is just that, belief that itself can't be proven. Not only that, but the text doesn't show evidence of the author having made up the miracle account. A fiction writer ordinarily adds supernatural elements in order to create excitement or spectacle and to capture reader attention, but this writer doesn't capitalise on the event at all in that way. The fish is mentioned only in two brief verses and there are no descriptive details. It's reported more as a simple fact of what happened, so let's not get distracted by the fish even though I'd like to point out he just got distracted by the fish for quite a while. One more from a site called Enduring Word. Some people question if this could happen as the Bible says it did. But surely it is not a difficult thing for God to have prepared a great fish, even if that particular fish was a special creation for that moment. I always find it just a little cringy and embarrassing when fundamentalist commentators try to justify stories like this, sometimes, like that last writer, invoking special creations. Yeah, sure, God suddenly created a large fish for the sole, pardon the pun, for the sole purpose of swallowing Jonah. Yeah, that's, that's not at all implausible. Or they try to find pseudo-scientific explanations for why it would actually be possible for Jonah to be swallowed by a fish or a whale and survive three days in its stomach. As one commentator explained, we know that a whale's stomach can hold at least the equivalent of a man in terms of weight and volume. Sure, problem solved then, right? We don't have to worry about drowning in a bath of hydrochloric acid, do we? I find it frustrating that these people waste their precious brain cells on trying to explain these things. Don't they feel just a little twinge of embarrassment? And once again, all commentators like this do is demonstrate clearly their appalling lack of understanding of the biblical text on which they claim to base their faith.